Stories Bigger Than Texas, the Alamo podcast. As the calendar flips to a new year, so does our story. January 1836, the Mexican army is marching north. Figures like David Crockett, James Bowie, and James Butler Bonham are making their way to the Alamo. Today, we reveal the primary documents that tell the story of January 1836 and the moods these documents capture, all while the threads of history are converging. I'm your host, Emily Bauckham. Colby Lanham, the Alamo senior researcher and historian, is with us today. Welcome back to the podcast, Colby. Thank you. We left off in December 1835 with the Texans taking the fighting down to Matamoros. Yeah, so the uh, you know the fighting in Matamoros is is a pretty pivotal moment from the Texas Revolution, and uh, it nearly splinters the entire newly formed Texian government and the army in half. There are a lot of people who don't want it to happen. Uh, there's a lot of supplies that were taken from uh, San Antonio in particular for that expedition, and it's a complete and utter failure. And um, it's a resounding loss, and, and it's felt throughout the Texian government and the military. And so it's a, it's a pretty pivotal point in the Texas Revolution. So much about what we know about January 1836 is from letters. Why is that so important to you as a historian? Letters are a window to the past. Uh, they allow you to speak uh, or at least hear the words or see the words of an individual that is no longer here. Historians do a pretty good job of translating that material over for the general public to consume, but to get the information directly from the person and the written word is, is astounding. It's, it's really important. On January 6, 1836, Santa Ana and his men arrive in Saltillo, Mexico, southwest of Monterey. That means they need to just march about 380 more miles until they get to San Antonio. Yeah, I love that. 381 miles uh, today in a car for Texans is, you know, going to get groceries. But um, the Mexican army, uh, 381 miles is a nightmare. Um, they have a heck of a trip. There is a is an absolute nightmare for the Mexican army. Logistically, it's, it's, ter- it's terrible. Um, the force march is, is very quick and uh, it's exhausting. So this is not a slow and steady march. No, not at all. Uh, they're on, they're in a rush to get up here, mind you. They're uh, they have camp followers, so that's women and children who are probably the families of the men in the Mexican army, or most likely are. And then they've also got all the supplies. They're bringing eight pieces of artillery with them, which is an, its own uh, logistical headache, and uh, not to mention the horses and all the animals. Grueling. Yeah. On Saturday, January 9th, David Crockett is in San Augustine, Texas. That's in East Texas, close to the Louisiana border. He writes a letter to his family, and he says he's in high spirits. Yeah, he had a, a pretty um, pretty eventful trip down here. Um, he's kind of welcomed along the way, stops in Little Rock, and he's welcomed there. And he gets into Texas, and it's kind of like, oh, I've arrived. You know, I'm, I'm here, and... Um, you know, his, his quote on the garden spot of, the, of Texas, or this garden spot of the world, excuse me, it really resounds to the people of that period, but he is, he's found his place, is what it seems like. He says he had a hearty welcome thanks to a dinner and a party of ladies. Yeah, so they throw a little uh, dinner for him, and that's kind of a common thing where, where Crockett is, people want to be. Uh, and, I, and I heard that that party is pretty um, kind of rambunctious, if you will, and also the one in Little Rock was pretty wild. He had a party. A cannon was fired on his arrival, and he wrote to his family, don't worry about me, basically. And the quote is, I am among friends. Yeah, again, you know, Crockett travels with a small group of uh, other men. And, um, you know, they get to Texas, and they said, since, okay, we're here. We've, we've done it. And uh, now he's here to uh, carve a life out for himself and hopefully for his family to come right after him. A few days later, on Wednesday, January 13th, Makaisha Autry writes to his wife. He writes, quote, I go whole hog in the cause of Texas. Yeah, he's putting all of his chips on the table. Uh, this is a uh, new start to back something that he truly believes in, uh, likely that his friends and neighbors are doing the same thing. And so uh, he's dedicating everything he's got to a cause. He writes that he expects to help with the independence movement and forming a government and that this is worth risking many lives for. Yeah, this is very reminiscent of the American Revolution that, you know, likely some of these men who are taking part in it, their grandfathers, uh, in some cases their fathers, um, would have taken part in it, and this is their moment. Autry tells his wife he's entitled to land in exchange for his help. Does he ever get this land? You know, he, he dies here at the Battle of the Alamo, but his family does benefit from his service, and he receives a little under 4,000 acres, uh, which is, is, a, is a large sum of uh, land, and his family is able to live on that. 
And uh, the Texan government's pretty good about vetting claims after the revolution is done. Uh, specifically, you know, Crockett, he, his family comes down and they stay and uh, they have a plot of land here in Texas. Autry also writes that rumors are flying, that Santa Ana is prepared to flee to Europe if things don't go his way. Is this something that's proven or truly just a rumor? You know, I, I think that falls more on kind of the myth and rumor side of things. Um, Santa Ana is a flighty individual. Uh, he has a knack for knowing when to cash in his chips and, 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 and uh, take off. And he does it several times during his lifetime, but I don't think that's one of them that's happening here. Another noteworthy thing in his letter is that he writes that David Crockett has joined the company. Just goes to show Crockett's a, a very famous person in this time. Yeah, it, it'd be like Denzel Washington walking into the room. I mean, it's that big. He, he is uh, a magnet for excitement, and uh, seeing someone of that caliber join the cause must mean you're heading in the right direction. The very next day after Autry has written his letter, Thursday, January 14th, James Neal writes to Sam Houston, and so far, the letters we've read and discussed have been pretty upbeat, but this one takes a turn. Yeah, Neil is a realist. He's a true military commander, and he sees the precarious situation that the Alamo garrison is in. Not only are they short on supplies, they're short on men, and uh, it's not a good. It's not a good deal. Uh, some people have said the key to Texas is the Alamo, and if that's the case, it needs to be properly outfitted, and it's it's, it's in a precarious situation. He literally writes, the men are almost naked, and a lot of them want to go home. Yeah, um, contrary to, to today in the military, where if you were to join the Army, they would provide for you all the things you would need to survive. They provide your food, your shelter, um, your firearms, all of those things. It's not the case back then. You would show up for duty. They would pay you a small sum. In some cases, you got the money. Some some cases, you had to fight the government for it after the fact. And some of these guys are wearing basically rags. He is laying the stakes on the table. He says... Hope we get reinforcements or else we'll be overrun by the enemy. Yeah, he's not being dramatic here. Um, this is a true dire situation where you have a skeleton force guarding a key position uh, within Texas, and it wouldn't take much for someone to come in and take that from them. But Neil also says, if we don't get reinforcements, I won't surrender. Yeah, he's kind of like Makai Jotri. You know, he's, he's willing to sacrifice his life, but he doesn't want to needlessly throw it away. He wants the supplies to put up a, a good fight. On January 19th, James Bowie and James Butler Bonham arrive at the Alamo. What will their roles be, and what kind of place are they arriving to at this point? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, they're arriving to a, a kind of a scene of chaos a little bit. Um, there is a, a group that's saying, you know, listen, it's 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 winter time. They're not going to come back till the spring. We have plenty of time. Some people are not as worried as others in their roles as far as that. James is, uh, that's kind of an uh, interesting situation where you've got two people kind of vying for one spot, William Barrett Travis and James Bowie, when Neil leaves to take care of family matters. And so um, you have this kind of tense standoff where they end up sharing command, uh, both lieutenant colonels. On January 23rd, James Neal writes to the governor saying that a courier has brought a letter letting them know Santa Ana arrived in Saltillo with 3,000 troops. They actually got there on January 6th, but Neil doesn't find out until January 21st thereabouts. News traveled so much slower in those days. Yeah, no Twitter um, to send that word around. And it would have been very beneficial if that were the case because Neil needs to know that in order to get men and supplies to properly outfit the garrison. Uh, the fact that he's finding out so late must have been a shock uh, to the Texians. How do you prepare for that? Yeah, you, you basically scrape together whatever you can. The Texas provi Texian provisional government is going to have to send whatever supplies they got. That's why the Matamoros expedition was such a pivotal part because they stole or they stole off with or took uh, so much of the provisions that would have kept the, the garrison held uh, together here at the Alamo. On January 29th, William B. Travis writes to the governor of Texas, and it is a dark letter. Uh, yeah, it's very bleak. Um, and again, he's being honest. Um, it, it, they find themselves in a very precarious situation with, uh, and, and I think Travis has something to the effect of, uh, he'll follow his orders, I'll paraphrase, I'll follow my orders, but I am weary to go into the country with so few men and so little supplies. So he's doing as he's told, as a good soldier would, uh, but knowing full well that we're in a tight spot. He says, we're getting ready to march to San Antonio with about 30 men, but a standout quote is, our affairs are gloomy indeed. Yeah, there's some idea that, um, you know, maybe that not everyone knew exactly what they were getting into, and that is true in some cases, but it's it's kind of obvious the word has spread about what happened at Matamoros and uh, the issues with the fledgling government, and um, people are nervous. You talked about how on the Mexican side it was a grueling, exhausting march. 
On the Texas side, it sounds like everyone's worn down, exhausted with war. Volunteers are hard to find. Yeah, um, there were some people who were on the fence. You know, we joke a little bit about San Antonio specifically because we say, um, you know, the Mexican uh, population, the native Mexican population in, in San Antonio, for instance, they didn't really want to go along with any of this. Why? Because they don't have short memories. They remember what happened in the other revolution. They remember what happened at um, the Battle of Medina. And so they are likely telling their neighbors, hey, listen, you're, you're going to get on a horse that's going to buck and you better be ready for that. And so some people are very nervous about the outcome of what, what will be. Travis writes to the governor, Texas needs to raise money for an army or, quote, Texas is gone to ruin. Those are heavy words. Yeah. Um, yeah. Travis had a way of expressing himself for sure. Uh, he's not wrong. Um, we, you know, we needed those supplies. Um, you know, Napoleon said that the army uh, lives on its belly. You know, in, if you don't have food and supplies and logistical supply chain is not set up, it can be disastrous for an army, especially one that's newly formed, mostly of militia. Um, and some men who had proper military experience. But overall, you've got kind of a, a wide mix of individuals. you got to get them all in a line. Something else Travis wrote that really stood out, and I'm quoting, I have strained every nerve. I have used my personal credit and have slept neither day, not night. Yeah, so this is accurate. There are a lot of Texians who die at the Battle of the Alamo and other battles like Goliad and San Jacinto who put a extreme stress on their personal finances in order to bankroll the Texan revolution. Uh, there were a couple of key individuals that lived through the revolution who were very wealthy at the beginning, who were bankrupt at the end, and some who just barely scrape out. And so he's one of those men who's taking out loans and um, you know accumulating a lot of debt in hopes that the revolution is successful. As January 1836 closes, we start to see all the threads of the story converging. All the main players, either in San Antonio or making their way there, are they getting a sense of what awaits them? Yeah, this is um, this is kind of culminating to this this massive buildup, and they're starting to get an idea of okay, something's got to give here, um, and so they're starting to see uh, what's about to be the final act. And the Alamo in this period, what's it like right now? Uh, the Alamo itself is, um, you know, it's sitting on the outside of town. Most of the Texan revolutionary soldiers who are in the area are living in the town itself, San Antonio. It isn't until the Mexican army comes they realize they can't hold a town, a cluster of houses. It'd be very difficult with the number of men they have. And the Alamo becomes the key site of refuge, kind of the city on a hill, uh, if you will. And that's where they're going to they're gonna make their last stand. Colby Lanham, thank you for joining us. That's where we leave off January 1836 with so much more to come. Yeah, thank you for having me. If you've enjoyed these podcasts and want to keep listening, we hope you'll join Friends of the Alamo. Our Friends of the Alamo members live across Texas, the United States, and all around the world. A true network of history enthusiasts dedicated to preserving the Shrine of Texas Liberty. So be sure to check out the podcast notes for the link to become a member. Benefits include free admission to the Alamo exhibit and sneak previews of new exhibits like the Travis Letter, returning to the Alamo next month. There will be a members-only preview on February 22nd before it goes on public viewing from February 23rd to March 24th. You've been listening to Stories Bigger Than Texas, the Alamo podcast. <laughs> <laughs>